Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome once again to Story Hour. My name is Carol Gooden, and I'm media specialist at Windmill Point Elementary School. Today I'd like to share with you some stories that I found very interesting, because from them I learned a lot about some history. The first story is called A Flag for Our Country by Eve Spencer. It was a warm spring day. Betsy Ross was sewing by the open window in her shop. The day seemed quiet, but this was not really a quiet time, for the year was 1776 and America was at war. America was fighting to be free from England. Betsy believed in the war, even though it had hurt her deeply. Six months before, her husband, John Ross, had been killed in the war. How she missed him. Betsy and John had made so many plans. They had even opened their own small shop in Philadelphia for making clothes. Betsy's father wanted her to close the shop after John was killed, but Betsy said no. She did not want to give up the shop. She would run it alone. There's a story about what happened to Betsy on that spring day in 1776. Early that afternoon, the door of Betsy Ross's shop opened. She looked up from her sewing amazed to see General George Washington in her shop. Behind him were Robert Morris and her uncle George Ross. General George Washington was the leader of the American army. He was a great hero, but most people were a little afraid of him. Betsy Ross greeted the three men with a curtsy. She was thrilled that General Washington was in her shop. But why had he come? Then the general spoke. He said that he, ha he, he and the men had come to ask her a favor. They wanted her to make a flag. George Washington told Betsy Ross that this would be different from any other flag. This would be the first flag of the new nation, the United States of America. There had been other American flags before, but now things were different. America was no longer a part of England, and General Washington wanted a flag that showed America to be free. Betsy Ross listened to George Washington. She had no idea how to make a flag, but she wanted to help win the war, and she wanted to say yes to General Washington. I can try, she told the general. Betsy Ross led the men to the room in back of the shop. All eyes were on General Washington as he unfolded a drawing of the new flag. The flag had 13 red and white stripes. In the corner of the flag were 13 stars. The stars were in no real order. Each of the stars had six points. Betsy looked at the drawing. The 13 stars and 13 stripes stood for the 13 American colonies. It would be a good flag, she thought, but it could use a little work. Now someone else might have been afraid to say anything to General Washington, but not Betsy Ross. She suggested that the stars would look better in a circle. And another thing about the stars, she said, a star with five points would look better than a star with six points. General Washington thought so too. But wouldn't a five-pointed star be harder to make, he asked. Nothing easier, Betsy said. She folded a sheet of paper a few times. Then she took just one snip with her scissors and unfolded the paper. Betsy had done an amazing thing. She had cut a perfect five-pointed star. A smile spread across General Washington's face. Then and there, he sat down at the desk and redrew the flag. Now the stars were in a circle. Each star had five points. 
This was the flag Betsy would make. Betsy worked hard for a week. She borrowed an old flag to see how it was made. Then she bought some thread and bunting. Bunting is a cloth used for making flags. First, Betsy cut out 13 five-pointed stars with one snip each. Then, with small straight stitches, she sewed the stars onto a piece of blue bunting. It was not easy. Betsy sewed and re-sewed the stars until they were perfect. The stripes were not as hard to make, but she had to sew them many times to make sure they would stay together. At last, Betsy Ross was pleased with her flag. She hoped that the general would be pleased too, and he was. In fact, he liked it so much, he wanted her to make more flags. This was good news. Now she would have work for a long time. Long after the war had ended, Betsy Ross often told the story of the first flag to her children and grandchildren. And for many years, Betsy's family were the only people who knew the story. Then in 1870, Betsy's grandson, William Canby, made a speech about it. He thought what his grandmother had done was important. Many people believed the story about the first flag but other people weren't sure. The story was almost 100 years old when William made his speech. And in telling the story, William could only say what he remembered hearing. William tried to show that the story was true. He looked for proof, but he could not find any. There was only the family story. We may never know whether or not Betsy Ross made our first flag. History keeps some secrets forever, but we do know Betsy Ross loved her country, and we know our flag still flies over a free nation. That was the story, A Flag for Our Country, by Eve Spencer. Getting a feel for history is really interesting when you read books. In this story, Fish Rye, by Robin Saunders, one gets the feel of what it was like to go picnicking early in the 20th century. When Edith opened her eyes, the sun was already shining warm on her face. She dressed as fast as she could in drawers with tatting across the back, cotton stockings, a shimmy, a white dress, and a jumper. She buttoned up her billikins and ran down the stairs. Daddy had left the house when it was still dark. I have to get to the river before the fish wake up, he had said. Mama had been awake for hours too, busy baking things to take to the fish fry. Edith, sit down and eat your breakfast, Mama said. Then you can help me fill these baskets. They packed cookies and cakes and pies, still hot from the big black stove, quart jars of pickles floating with spices, and smaller jars of thick, dark jams speckled with tiny seeds. Is that everything, Mama asked? Yes, Edith said. They carried the baskets out to the wagon. George and Nell were already hitched up and waiting, stamping their feet every now and then to drive away the horseflies. Morning, Nan, called Mrs. Green from next door. Who's that big girl helping you? Morning, said Mama. Fine day for the fish fry. 
Seems like half the town is going, Mrs. Green said. I better get myself ready. Where is that Eugene? Eugene Green wasn't going to be left behind. When I went to the fish fry last year, he told Edith, there were catfish coming out of the trees. Were not, Edith said. Were too, said Eugene. If the trees aren't full of fish, you can push me in the river. All right, Edith said. There were lots of things to look forward to. Edith, Mama said now, get your bonnet and Katie. The wagon had two wide seats for the grown-ups. Mama sat up front with Jake, the hired man. But Edith and Katie, who was her best friend, liked to sit in the back and let their legs hang down. The wagon rolled down Main Street, past the courthouse and the drugstore, to the edge of town. They stopped at the railroad tracks to let the morning train pass, and Edith and Katie waved to the engineer. Then they headed down a broad dirt road. Edith and Katie took turns jumping out of the wagon and running alongside. When they got good and dusty, they played games, like who could count the most spotted cows. Sometimes they just lay back and looked up at the clouds. When are we going to get there? Edith asked. Oh, it's a way yet, Mama said. Now there were wagons in front of them and in back of them. A winding line of wagons and horses and mules. Edith could smell the river long before she could see it, hidden among pine trees and hickories and persimmons. Finally, their wagon rolled to a stop. And from the branches of every tree hung sleek, whiskered catfish. Daddy stood at a high table skinning fish with his long knife while Mr. Green tended the fires. Mama set right to work with an iron fork and a big black skillet. Run along, she said to the girls. Keep your bonnets on and stay away from that river. So Edith and Katie played hopscotch and then tag with some of the boys until Eugene Green said, I'm so hungry I could eat an alligator. And then it was time for dinner on the ground. There were butter beans and potato salad, deviled eggs and hushed puppies, and even more fried catfish than even Eugene Green could eat. For dessert, there were all those cookies, cakes, and pies, and watermelon cooled in the river. Edith was so full, she sat still for a minute until Eugene Green whispered, Psst, come on. I'll show you the biggest old alligator in the river. I don't believe you, Edith said, but she went anyway. First, they stopped at a sweet gum tree to get something to chew on. Then, Eugene led Edith around a blackberry patch. The river swirled lazily around rocks and tree trunks in the still of the afternoon. And it was so quiet that Edith heard a turtle slide down the bank and plop into the water. See those bubbles, Eugene said, rising near that stump? Edith nodded. Well, if you lean way over, you'll see that old alligator on the river bottom, fat and sleepy and bigger than both of us. Edith leaned and Eugene pushed just a little and suddenly Edith was standing in the river right next to the turtle with cool thick mud oozing over the top of her billikins and her bonnet sailing downstream like a pink and white boat. Eugene, she shouted. Eugene Green was laughing. Weren't there fish coming out of the trees? Mama gave Edith a real talking to, but Eugene Green's mother gave him a good spanking. Daddy and Jake went down to the river to pull out the last net. And what did they find? Just about the 
biggest alligator anyone had seen that far up the river. It was dark green and bumpy, with a big, thick tail and great rows of teeth. Eugene was as surprised as everyone else, but only for a second. Then he grinned. See, he said to Edith, until Katie spoke up. Still hungry enough to eat an alligator, Eugene Green? The alligator gave a loud hiss that made them all jump. Then it lashed its tail and tottered back down to the water. There would be plenty to tell the folks in town about this fish fry. On the way home, Daddy and Jake sat up front. Edith and Katie sat in the second seat next to Mama and counted fireflies until they both fell asleep. Fish Fry by Susan Saunders. Our next story comes from Mexico. It's called How Far, Felipe? And it's by Genevieve Gray. Felipe lived with Uncle Carlos, Aunt Maria, and his six cousins. His friend was Filomeno, a baby burro. Filomeno was very loud, but very small, too small to help on the farm. Uncle Carlos tried to grow corn but the land was poor. Felipe was often hungry. So were his cousins. So were most people in their town in Mexico. One day in the plaza, Felipe and Filomena saw an officer talking to the crowd. I'm Colonel Anza, he said. The Viceroy of Mexico needs 30 families to settle in California. Land is rich there. It is good for farms and ranches. Each family will get clothes, food, horses, and ranch animals, all free. California is four months away by horseback. My soldiers and I will take you there. Who will go? Food, clothes, whispered Felipe to Filomena. Then he shouted, I will go. Others began to shout, we will go to California. Philomena cried, ee She was so loud that horses reared and pigs squealed. Get that burro out of here, cried Colonel Anza. Felipe ran to tell Uncle Carlos, but An Uncle Carlos said, California is too far away. Who cares, said Aunt Maria. We live like toads here. We need the food and clothes. They went to sign up. I will take Philomena to California, Felipe said. No, said Uncle Carlos. She's too small to work. When will she be big enough, asked Felipe. When her shoulder is as tall as you, said Uncle Carlos. But the, by then, you will be in California. Eee! Ah, sang Philomena. Only Felipe understood. Philomena was going to California too. We will cross deserts and mountains, said Colonel Anza. We will meet friendly Indians and some that are not so friendly. It will be a hard journey. At last, everything was ready. Colonel Anza led the caravan. Behind him rode soldiers. Then came the families. Then more soldiers. Then the pack mules and the cattle. At the end came Philomena. Felipe rode on a horse. So did his cousins, Jose and Ruben. He looked and looked for Philomena. Then he heard her calling him. Eee the horses jerked the reins. The mules threw off their loads. Cattle ran into the bushes. The caravan stopped. 
get rid of that borough, shouted Colonel Anza. But no one heard him. The soldiers were too busy catching animals. Late that afternoon, Colonel Anza stopped beside a stream. We will camp here for the night, he said. Men unloaded the mules and put out the tents. Women built cooking fires and started supper. Children played in the woods. Felipe found Philomena eating grass with the mules. I love you, Philomena, whispered Felipe. She put her head against his chest. The next morning, a soldier blew a horn for time to get up. Philomena sang along. Yee-haw! Everyone got up very fast. Colonel Anza laughed. This burrow is not so bad, he said. After that, Philomena sang Time to Get Up every morning. Felipe was proud. Even Uncle Carlos looked a little pleased. A few days later, they came to a mountain pass. Rocks rose high all around. Colonel Anza was afraid of an Indian attack. Apache scouts will be watching from those rocks, he said. They went through the narrow pass. They climbed through a canyon. They crept along a ledge. No one slept that night. All night, Felipe listened for Apaches. He thought he saw some scouts, but they were only shadows. The caravan moved out at dawn. Nobody ate breakfast. By noon, we will be safe, said Colonel Anza. Then we will eat. California better be good, grumbled Aunt Maria. If we ever get there, said Uncle Carlos. They came to a desert. They rode for weeks through miles and miles and miles of desert. We left home last summer, said Felipe. Now it is nearly winter and no California. We're halfway there, said Colonel Anza. San Gabriel is only two months away. Everyone was too tired to care. Two months, two years, it's all the same, grumbled Aunt Maria. They came to a river. Indians lived along the bank. These are Pima Indians, said Colonel Anza. They're friendly. The Indians brought food. When Aunt Maria gave them chocolate to drink, they made faces and spit it out. The Apaches were better, said Aunt Maria. The caravan stayed there for three days. Felipe filled water kegs and helped with the animals. Uncle Carlos was surprised. Is Felipe a cowboy now? He said to Aunt Maria, what next? One day, the Indians gave a feast. Felipe ate lots of beans and corn. One man helped him cut up some watermelon for Philomena, but she didn't like watermelon, so Felipe ate her piece. The caravan moved on through the desert. Cold winds blew sand and dust. Now there was almost no water. There was no grass for the animals. Only Philomena found a few weeds to eat. It was so cold that Felipe and Philomena slept together to keep warm. The other animals stood all night hungry and cold with their backs to the wind. One morning, Felipe saw nine mules dead. Colonel Anza said sadly, no food, no water, it is a miracle that any are alive. If animals die, people may die, said Uncle Carlos. Felipe walked beside his tired horse. The cold wind whipped his face. He saw starving animals fall and die. That night, Uncle Carlos said, we must dig holes in the dry river to get water for the animals. Felipe told Philomena, I must help the men tonight, but you will stay warm. He asked his cousins, who wants to sleep with Philomena? I do, they all cried. 
Felipe worked all night digging holes for water. He brought animals to drink one by one. He forgot how cold and tired he was. But when dawn came, 96 more animals were dead. The caravan had to move on. Felipe saw something strange. What is that white stuff, he asked. Snow, said Colonel Anza. You never saw snow where you lived in Mexico. That night, they sat around tiny campfires, wrapped in blankets, but they were still cold. Next morning, the sky was clear. Felipe saw far mountains, all white with snow. California is nothing but ice and snow, cried Uncle Carlos. At home, we were poor, but at least we were warm. You want to go back, asked Aunt Maria. But the sun felt warm on Felipe's shoulders. Look, cried Cousin Ruben, the snow is melting a little. <gasps> ah, cried Philomena. The mountains were just ahead. She smelled water bubbling from the mountain springs. She smelled winter grass growing in the valleys. The horses walked faster. That afternoon, they came to the start of the mountains. There was water for everyone and rich grass for the animals. We made it, shouted Felipe. Felipe helped unload the tired animals and lead them to the grass. That was the hard part, cried Colonel Anza. The rest will be easy. God be thanked, said Aunt Maria. They rested for a week, then they climbed into the mountains. Tall trees and green grass grew everywhere. Felipe found sunflowers and wild grapes. The sun was bright on the river. There was plenty of fish. But where is California? Felipe asked. This is California, said Colonel Anza. We are almost at San Gabriel. Look at Philomena, cried Ruben. She is grown. Her shoulder is as tall as Felipe now, said Aunt Maria. <gasps> ah, sang Philomena proudly. She let Felipe climb on her back. Her muscles were strong. She trotted in a little circle, showing off. Our cowboy has a horse, cried Uncle Carlos. She will pull logs when we build our new house, cried Reuben, and plow, cried Uncle Carlos. Easy there, said Aunt Maria. Don't work our little friend too hard. She rubbed Philomena's nose. At last, they came through the mountains. They saw green hills rolling away to the sea. The fathers of the mission at San Gabriel came to meet them. We are home at last, whispered Felipe to Philomena. And Philomena sang, hee ah. That was the story, How Far, Felipe, by Genevieve Gray. Our next story is a neat one about quilting. This was an activity that occupied a lot of people many years ago. The story is called Sam Johnson and the Blue Ribbon Quilt, and it's by Lisa Campbell Ernst. Sam Johnson discovered a town torn awning over the pig's pen one morning while his wife was out of town. That evening, he settled down to mend the tear himself, taking pieces of cloth from Mrs. Johnson's scrap bag to patch the hole. At first, just running the needle in and out of the fabric was hard work. 
But as the evening wore on, Sam became more expert. Soon he was having a fine time choosing patches of different shapes and colors. It was sunrise before he leaned back to admire his night's work. What a masterpiece, he exclaimed, turning the design about. Just wait until Sarah sees this. She'll be mightily impressed. By the time Mrs. Johnson returned that afternoon, Sam was waiting for her on the porch. That's very nice, dear, she said, giving his handiwork a quick glance. I'm glad to see you kept yourself busy while I was away. But Sarah, don't you think it's beautiful? Sam protested. When Mrs. Johnson did not answer, Sam went on. I had so much fun doing it that I've decided to join your quilting club. Now, Sam, dear, Mrs. Johnson chuckled nervously. It's very nice that you enjoyed your little project while I was away. But my quilting club? Don't get carried away. That's no place for a man to be. Sewing is women's work. But Mrs. Johnson wasn't laughing the next night as she and Sam rode together to the weekly meeting of the Rosedale Women's Quilting Club. Nor did she crack a smile when they walked through the meeting room door and all the ladies turned and stared. Sam cleared his throat. Good evening, he said calmly. I've decided to join your club. After a few seconds of silence, a small snicker was heard, then another and another. Soon everyone in that whole room was laughing. Everyone, that is, but Sam. Don't be silly, the club president said. We can't have a man here bungling everything. Our most important quilt of the year is coming up, the one for the county fair contest. Why don't you go join the men's horseshoe or checkers club if you want something to do with your time? Sam stalked out of the room. The next morning, his hastily hung posters were scattered all around the county. Equal rights for men. <coughs> men unite. Sam's speech that evening was a rousing one. Men, he began, we have a very serious problem on our hands. He described what happened to the awning, waving it high in the air, <coughs> and then what happened at the quilting club meeting. He talked about freedom and the country and even about the Declaration of Independence. Finally, he explained that the quilt contest at the county fair. Are you willing, he said, to prove these ladies wrong? The men looked at one another and timidly nodded. Are you ready, his voice became louder, to show you can do more with your hands than plow a field? Yes, answered a small chorus of voices. Then, I say, he finished, we should enter that contest ourselves. This time, everyone clapped and cheered. The Rosedale Men's Quilting Club had officially begun. The county fair was only a month away, so the men didn't have much time. They met every night in Sam's barn, working awkwardly at first on the <coughs> flying geese design. <coughs> Meanwhile, the women were hard at work on their sailboats pattern. In the beginning, they thought the men's club was a joke. Quilting is much too delicate a job for men, they agreed. Soon, though, there were doubts. I wonder what their quilt looks like, the women's club president said one evening. I wonder what colors they're using. No one spoke up, but a hush fell over the room as everyone stitched faster. In their final week, each club worked far into the night, making their stitches small and neat 
their seams straight and exact. At dawn, on the day of the contest, the men and the women gently folded their quilts, laid them in the back of their wagons, and set out for the fairground. It was a cool, clear morning following a night of heavy rain. Each group wrapped its entry in old blankets to protect it from lingering drops. As the wagons passed through the fairground gates, the Rosedale Quilting Clubs paused a moment and looking quite smug, nodded their heads in greeting. Just then, a huge gust of wind blew up and both quilts were swept into the air. Each landed with a light splat in a giant mud puddle. No one could believe what had happened. All that work, Sam Johnson moaned, all those hours and hours and now, look, ruined. But then the women peered at the men's quilt and noticed how beautiful it was. And the men saw for the first time that the women's quilt was quite beautiful too. You really did a wonderful job, they said to each other. Too bad neither of us will win. Wait, Sam cried as everyone headed back to the wagons. I have an idea. All that morning and all that afternoon, the Rosedale Men's Quilting Club and the Rosedale Women's Quilting Club worked together. Carefully, delicately, they cut out the unsoiled sections of each quilt. Then they pieced together the unsplattered fabric. As the sun set, the last stitches were being put in to complete their amazing design. The fair was a great success. Elijah Poole's hog tipped the scales at a record weight. Harriet Amon's apple raisin pie swept every baking prize. And for the quilting contest, first prize was awarded to the just plain Rosedale Quilting Club. What's the name of your unusual design? Sam Johnson was asked. He paused for a moment, thinking, then replied, why, flying sailboats, of course. I hope you enjoyed Sam Johnson and the Blue Ribbon Quilt by Lisa Campbell Ernst. Very often we learn stories about other countries. We read them and it's, it's interesting what we can pick up. This story is about the country known as Holland and it is The Hole in the Dyke, a story retold by Norma Green with pictures by Eric Carle. This, I might add, is one of my favorite stories about another country. A long time ago, a boy named Peter lived in Holland. He lived with his mother and father in a cottage next to a tulip field. Peter loved to look at the old windmills turning slowly. He loved to look at the sea. In Holland, the land is very low and the sea is very high. The land is kept safe and dry by high, strong walls called dikes. One day, Peter went to visit a friend who lived by the seaside. As he started for home, he saw that the sun was setting and the sky was growing dark. I must hurry or I shall be late for supper, said Peter. Take the shortcut along the top of the dike, his friend said. They waved goodbye. Peter wheeled his bike to the road on top of the dike. 
It had rained for several days and the water looked higher than usual. Peter thought, it's lucky that the dikes are high and strong. Without these dikes, the land would be flooded and everything would be washed away. Suddenly, he heard a soft gurgling noise. He saw a small stream of water stri trickling through a hole in the dike below. Peter got off his bike to see what was wrong. He couldn't believe his eyes. There in the big, strong dike was a leak. Peter slid down to the bottom of the dike. He put his finger in the hole to keep the water from coming through. He looked around for help, but he could not see anyone on the road. He shouted. Maybe someone in the nearby field would hear him, he thought. Only his echo answered. Everyone had gone home. Peter knew that if he let the water leak through the hole in the dike, the hole would get bigger and bigger. Then the sea would come rushing through. The fields and the houses and the windmills would all be flooded. Peter looked around for something to plug up the leak so he could go to the village for help. He put a stone in the hole, then a stick, but the stone and the stick were washed away by the water. Peter had to stay there alone. He had to use all his strength to keep the water out. From time to time he called for help, but no one heard him. All night long Peter kept his finger in the dike. His fingers grew cold and numb. He wanted to sleep, but he couldn't give up. At last, early the next morning, Peter heard a welcome sound. Someone was coming. It was the milk cart rumbling down the road. Peter shouted for help. The milkman was surprised to hear someone near that road so early in the morning. He stopped and looked around. Help, Peter shouted. Here I am at the bottom of the dike. There's a leak in the dike. Help, help. The man saw Peter and hurried down to him. Peter showed him the leak and the little stream of water coming through. Peter asked the milkman to hurry to the village. Tell the people, ask them to send some men to repair the dike right away. The milkman went as fast as he could. Peter had to stay with his finger in the dike. At last, the men from the village came. They set to work to repair the leak. All the people thanked Peter. They carried him on their shoulders, shouting, make way for the hero of Holland, the brave boy who saved our land. But Peter didn't think of himself as a hero. He had done what he thought was right. He was glad that he could do something for the country he loved so much. This story of Peter and the hole in the dike is a story that has been told for many, many years in Holland. This version of the story is retold by Norma Green, and the pictures in the book were drawn by Eric Carle. History is a funny thing. It keeps on happening. This story is called The Birth of a New Tradition. It's a story by a student, Ramsey Amsar, with illustrations by Lane Yerkes. Sergi stood on the platform, arms outstretched, bracing himself for his final flip. His heart beat loudly in his chest. He glanced at the crowd that was waiting quietly for his finale. Thoughts flooded his mind. How long he had prepared for this competition.
how much he wanted and deserved to win. The sweat made his shirt cling to his muscular body. He pushed back his straight black hair and took a deep breath. Suddenly, he ran across the platform, somersaulted a few times, triple flipped in the air, and landed solidly on his feet. The crowd roared with excitement. He had done it. After five long years of training, he had finally won the right to perform in the gymnastics parade on Revolution Day. Sergi swelled with pride. He was now the best gymnast in his town. His parents rushed out and embraced him. His best friend, Vladi, who had won the championship the year before, congratulated him. Now Sergi knew that he would be going to Moscow to perform with the country's best gymnasts. During the next few weeks, all Sergi did was practice, hours and hours every day. He worked on perfecting his routine. His confidence was at its highest point. Vladi would join him sometimes, and his accounts of the parade made Sergi even more excited and impatient for the event. The mood in his country didn't match Sergi's, however. The political, economic, and social situation was deteriorating. Jobs and food were scarce. Sergi's parents were luckier than most, since they had steady jobs. The Soviet people were very unhappy. They envied the Western lifestyle. Some of the Soviet countries were already demanding their independence. While Sergi was busy preparing for the Revolution Day Parade that would celebrate communism, his country was falling apart. In the back of his mind, he was aware of the turmoil around him. Then it happened. The people took down Lenin's statue, and the Soviet Union was no more. In school, Sergi and his friends had been taught that the American way was wrong. But deep down in his heart, Sergi always wished he lived in America and had the freedom that Americans had. He wished he had all the wonderful toys that American children played with. This made him feel guilty, as if he was betraying his country. Now the Soviet Union was trying to become like America. Things started to change too fast for Sergi. Now that there was no more communism, he knew that there would be no Revolution Day parade. That tradition had ended. On the day his coach gently broke the news to him, he rushed out of the gym, slamming the door behind him. He started running and did not stop until his lungs hurt with every intake of breath. He didn't care about anything. All he could think of was missing his chance to make his dream come true. Sergi sat and leaned against the wall of an old building. He closed his eyes and let his memories take him back to earlier parades. He was only five years old the first time he had been there. Sitting on his father's shoulders, gripping his curly hair for dear life, his eyes were wide with fascination at the sight of the amazing gymnasts, musicians, and marching bands. The crowd around him was pushing to get a better view. He could almost hear their cheers now. He had strained his neck to keep the gymnasts in sight as long as possible, but the parade had ended too soon for him. The Revolution Day trip to Moscow had become a yearly tradition for his family. It was his favorite time of the whole year. He spent it with his parents, eating delicious borscht and kata bread 
in restaurants, listening to the music and watching the parade. What inspired Sergi most were the gymnasts. He wanted to be just as good as they were and perform in the parade with them. Only the best gymnasts in the country were chosen and he knew he could be the best. He and Vladi had practiced together, pushing each other on. Watching Vladi perform last year was his final push. Now it was supposed to be his turn. But there was no parade. Sergi was excited and sad at the same time. He wanted the changes in his country, for everything has to change. There was a lot of work ahead, and it was up to his generation to make Russia a great country once more. He would miss the parade, though. Why did that have to end? Couldn't they keep it? They could celebrate their newfound freedom. Yes, Freedom Day Parade. Sergi ran all the way back to the gym. He had a great idea about how to save the parade and couldn't wait to tell his coach. The Birth of a New Tradition by Ramsey Asmar, a classic example of a story helping us to understand how history unfolds daily. I hope you enjoyed it. We often take the way we live for granted, and we think that that's the way everybody lived. It's interesting that many, many years ago, people lived quite differently. Here's a story to tell you just that. It's called Dakota Dugout, and it was written by Ann Turner with illustrations by Ronald Himmler. Tell you about the prairie years? I'll tell you, child, how it was. When Matt Road come, I packed all I had, cups and pots and dresses and rope, even Grandma's silver book, boot hook, and rode the clickety train to a cave in the earth, Matt's cave. Built from sod, you know, with a special iron plow that sliced the long earth strips. Matt cut them into bricks, laid them up, dug into a hill that was our first home. I cried when I saw it. No sky came in that room, only a paper window that made the sun look greasy. Dirt fell on our bed, snakes sometimes too, and the buffalo hide door could not keep out the wind or the empty cries in the long grass. The birds visited me. There was no one else. With Matt all day in the fields, a hawk came, snake in its claws, a heron flapped by with wings like sails, and a sparrow jabbered the day long on a gray fence post. I jabbered back. Winter came sudden, slam bang, the ground was iron, cattle breath turned to ice, froze their noses to the ground. We lost 12 in a storm, and the wind scoured the dugout. Wish, hush, wish, hush. Spring, child, was teasing slow, then quick. Water booming in the lake, geese like yarn in the sky. Green spreading faster than fire, and the wind blowing, shush, hush, shush, hush. First summer, we watched the corn grow, strode around the field, clapping hands. We saw dresses, buggies, gold in that grain, until one day, a hot wind baked it dry as an oven. Matt sat and looked 
two whole days, silent and long. Come fall, we snug like beavers in our burrow, new grass on the floor, willows or roof under the earth. I pasted newspaper on the wall, set bread to bake on the coals, and the wind was quiet. Corn grew finally. We got our dresses, buggies, some gold. Built a clapboard house with windows like suns, Floors I slipped on, and the empty sound of too many rooms. Didn't think I'd miss the taste of earth in the air. Now the broom went whisp hush, and the clock talked like a busy heart. Talking brings it near again, the sweet taste of a new bread in a Dakota dugout. How the grass whispered like an old friend, how the earth kept us warm. Sometimes the things we start with are best. Dakota Dugout by Ann Turner. Could you have lived in a house like that? Watch the Stars Come Out by Ricky Levinson tells us about what it was like to come to this country. Grandma told me when her mama was a little girl, she had red hair just like me. Grandma's mama loved to go to bed early and watch the stars come out just like me. Every Friday night after the dishes were put away, Grandma's mama would come to her room and tell her a special story. When I was a little girl, my big brother and I went on a big boat to America. Mama and Papa and sister were waiting there for us. My aunt, Mama's sister, took us to the boat. She didn't bring my two little brothers. They were too small. They would come on a boat when they were older. Aunt gave us a barrel full of dried fruit. She asked an old lady to watch over us, and she did. She also ate our dried fruit. The old lady and brother and I went down the steps to our room. I counted the steps as we carried our bundles down, but there were so many I forgot to count after a while. Sometimes the boat rocked back and forth. It was fun. Some people didn't like it. They got sick. The old lady got very, very sick. She died. Brother told me not to worry. He would take care of me. He was 10. At night, when I went to sleep, I couldn't see the stars come out in the sky. That made me sad. Each morning when we got up, Brother put a mark on his stick. I counted them, 23. The last morning, we looked across the water. There were two islands near each other. One of them had a statue standing on it, a lady with a crown. Everyone got very excited and waved to her. I did too. When the boat stopped, we carried our bundles down the plank. I started to cry. I didn't see Mama and Papa and Sister. A sailor told me not to worry. We would see them soon. We went on another boat to a place on an island. We carried our bundles into a big, big room. Brother and I went into a small room with all the other children without Mamas and Papas. A lady looked at me all over. I wondered why. I waited for Brother. The lady looked at him, too. The next day, we went on a ferry. The land came closer and closer as we watched. Everyone waved. We did, too. Mama and Papa and Sister were there. We went on a trolley to our home. Mama said it was a palace. Mama's palace was on the top floor. I counted the steps as we walked up. Fifty-two. 
Mama and Papa's room was in the middle. Our room was in the front, and in the back was the kitchen with a big black stove. Mama warmed a big pot of water on the stove. She poured some into the sink and helped me climb in to wash. Mama washed my hair, and when it was dry, she brushed it. It felt good. Sister gave us cookies and glasses of tea. I was very tired. I kissed Mama and Sister goodnight. Papa patted me on my head and said I was his little princess. I went into our room and climbed into Sister's bed. It was right next to the window. I watched the stars come out. One, two, three. This Friday night, I will go to bed very early and watch the stars come out in the sky. I hope Grandma will come to my room and tell me another special story. Ricky Levinson's Watch the Star Come Out. The illustrations were by Diane Good. <laughs>